the sniff me out, get to Australia. <laughs> Welcome to Modern Grand Tour with me, Garland Lowe. After completing the European leg of my round the world journey, we now arrive in the world's largest country, Russia. Riding the full length of the famous Trans-Siberian Railway, we'll couch surf with locals along the way to get an insider's view of the fascinating Russian culture. Beginning in the western part of this Eurasian country, my new Russian friends and I explore St. Petersburg, Moscow, Vladimir Suzdal, Nizhny Novgorod, Perm and Yekaterinburg. Then in the eastern part we discover Tobolsk and Tumen, Novosibirsk, Okutsk and Okhon Island, Ulan Ude, Habarovsk and finally Vladivostok. In this 8th episode across Russia and the 16th in this Modern Grand Tour series, we'll learn about the bizarre painter and spiritualist Nicholas Rerick, go back in time in an immersive USSR museum and of course meet the locals. So let's explore Russia's third largest city and the unofficial capital of Siberia. Novosibirsk. In attempting to speak uh, the little Russian I know with Andrei, I said some words that uh, I was taught in uh, in previous encounters with my <laughs> couch serving hosts. Uh, so I said this word. Uh, which I'm not going to repeat anymore because I've been told it's a bad word because it is niet kultura niet kultura bad bad word bad word if other people hear bad word and I think I also got the sign that I would be sent over into the forest and then yeah there you go if I said this bad word I go out in the forest and uh, That'll be the end of B. Spasiba Andre. There you go. Friendship. Kitai. Russia. Friendship. There's so much pollution. It's windy. It's all blown down here. And I can see it. I can see the dust and the. <coughs> Just look at the cars. Novosibirsk, which loosely translates to mean New Siberia, was founded incredibly only in 1893 as a settlement for builders constructing a Trans-Siberian railway bridge. After the bridge was completed, the builders moved on, but the settlement survived and grew rapidly due to first local peasants using it as a transportation hub for their grain, second Stalin's industrialization, third the Great Soviet Famine which saw the intake of 170,000 rural refugees, and fourth the Second World War which saw businesses move east and another 140,000 war refugees. By the 1960s it was the youngest city in the world that had over a million people. Today, Novosibirsk, which is still under 150 years old, is Russia's third largest city and the unofficial capital of Siberia. It is also home to my couch surfing host Max, who I briefly met in the morning before exploring the city. So we're in our Lenin Square, Prosha Lenina, uh, and he's very big, he's every, everywhere I go in Russia, he's there. Yeah. You cannot escape him. What is this behind us? Like the the, the theatre. Everywhere I go, also in Russia, the theatre has been a real big building. Always in the middle of the city centre. It seems like a very important part of Russian culture. I know only this is biggest opera theatre, maybe uh, yeah, in Russia. The biggest in Russia. Big Lenin, big theatre, and that pretty much summarises my feelings of Russia. Everything is big. This is Soviet city and it's, that's why so many of big buildings. big buildings. The first attraction I visited happened not to be a Soviet building, but rather something built during the Russian Empire period. Built in 1899, just six years after Novosibirsk was founded, the Alexander Nevsky Cathedral was the settlement's first stone building. However, 20 years later, the communists took over, and following Marxist ideas that religion is the opium of the people, churches were repurposed, with the Alexander Nevsky Cathedral being turned into an office. In 1989, towards the end of the Soviet Union, and exactly 100 years since it was built, the cathedral was reopened. Today, the Russian Orthodox Church has not only seen a dramatic rise in those who identify as Orthodox Christian, but the faith is now considered a defining characteristic of Russian identity, largely due to the support of Vladimir Putin, who in turn has been called by the head of the Orthodox Church a miracle of God. 
With the mutual benefits of an ever closer relationship between church and state, you could call this a match made in heaven. My next stop was the USSR Museum, which basically was a house full of old stuff. What is this? Is it a hairdryer? What is that? I need to ask you what this is. Oh, that's nice. Ha, <laughs> how <laughs> What's that? It's like a game, isn't it? <laughs> Must be a really boring game, though. What's that? It's like an old calculator. I'm sure we had that in the UK as well. Look at this. Oh, I think I think I had one of these. Look at these old rollerblades. Christ. Too poor to have a uh, working television. So uh, in the Soviet times, they just blue tack a picture of their favourite politician. Look how the USSR flag is different on all of these medals. I think what that is, is that each of the countries that belong to the USSR have their own flag. Armenia, Moldova, Turkmenistan. I never knew they each had their own USSR flags. This is like a really cool second hand shop or one of those stalls that you find in Camden. What was that? Why do you need so many? You can only receive calls on this one. <laughs> These are back in fashion. Maybe the Soviet times are coming back. Sewing machines, irons, hi-fi, toys. Like in England if we had a 70s or 80s museum it wouldn't be too dissimilar to this. Maybe the funny thing is all of this was used in the Soviet times in 1990. <laughs> we had it in the 70s. See, so that would be interesting. The idea of it being a little bit held back, the Soviet times. And that summation isn't too far off. Because in the command economy of the communist USSR, the heavy industry of producing military equipment took precedence over the light industry of producing consumer goods, which was seen as an extension of decadent capitalism. This meant that state manufactured consumer goods often were poor quality, offered little choice in range, and suffered from shortages. However, if you were wealthy enough, you could buy illegally sold foreign goods such as American jeans, British music, and Japanese electronics. These products were part of a larger black market called the USSR's second economy, which also included selling state products at marked up prices, offering private services, and taking bribes which altogether has been estimated to account for an incredible 60% of GDP. Some people who supposedly began their careers in the second economy are these guys, who started by selling Bibles, cars, being a private cab driver, selling theatre tickets, running a private cafe and siphoning money. And who after the collapse of communism used these entrepreneurial skills and questionable networks to become the original oligarchs of the new and wild capitalist Russia where these six people control a ludicrous 50% of the economy. So, uh, signing out, Comrade Lowe. Built in 1915, the tiny chapel of St Nicholas was said to be the geographical centre of the massive Russian Empire. But in the 1930s, it was demolished by the atheist state and replaced with a statue of Stalin. In 1993, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the chapel was rebuilt and today provides a little bit of sanctuary right in the middle of the city's busiest road. I'm about to walk into the museum, given a star in the Lonely Planet. My last attraction in Novosibirsk was a museum dedicated to a Russian artist. Now, with a whole building given to him, one might assume that the celebrated artist would be one of Russia's most internationally recognised, such as the medieval icon painter Andrei Rublev or the 19th century realist Ilya Repin, or the abstract pioneer Vasily Kandinsky. But no, instead it was this man. At the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, Nicholas Rurik began life as a painter of Russian folklore, typically depicting Christian warriors in medieval battle. However, following the 1917 Russian Revolution, he and his family emigrated to the US, where they became heavily involved in the occult. In 1923, the Rurik family set out on an expedition across Asia, with an extraordinary goal to find the mystical land of Shambhala, where Nicholas Rurik would supposedly lead a utopian community. After five years of travelling and unable to find Shambhala, the family settled in the Indian Himalayas, continuing their studies on Eastern culture. Today, Nicholas Rurik is considered a genius in Russia, 
as exemplified not only by this dedicated museum, but also by similar museums in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Internationally, however, it may be Rurik's bizarre beliefs that make him a curious figure. But maybe he was on something. I'm just saying. Today, on the train, I tried to speak Russian to the man next to me. So firstly I said, Piz Pizdets. That's a really good word. Ah, okay. What is this? What does this word mean? It's hard to explain, but it means something bad. It's like Pizdets, this soup is not a able to eat. Would you advise me never to say this? Mm -hmm. Indeed, in 2014, President Putin banned swear words from all arts and media, with four words in particular being highlighted for the chop, due to them being the root word for other swear words. The four words are Koi, Pista, Yibat and Piliad. The ban, seen by some as the advancement of family values, was for others further encroachment upon freedom of speech in Russia. OK, I will never say this. We then discuss the five stands, not those ones otherwise known as Central Asia, and once part of the Soviet Union. Uh, your father was from Turkmenistan. Your mother is from... She's Russian. She's Russian. And is the, the marriage normal in Russian society? Yeah, it was normal in Soviet society. We are very multicultural country, and there is a lot of uh, mixed bloods. Does racism exist in Russia? Yeah, of course. As a, just like in every country. Which group mm -hmm. experience the most racism? People from Middle Asia. There are many migrants and le level of uh, criminal is growing up. Your background is from Middle Asia. Yeah, but he's from Soviet Middle Asia. It's not the same. He is a worker. He was totally normal Soviet citizen. Have you personally experienced racism in Russia? No, because I don't acting like migrant. Because I'm a Russian. I was born here. I speak Russian. Do you feel you have another level of identity? Totally don't, don't feel it. Because it's normal for, for this country. And so heading back to the train, I could reflect that the young city of Novosibirsk, with its industrial streets, imposing squares and monumental buildings, was the most Soviet city I had encountered outside of Moscow. Or maybe it was just the effects of this hat. So it's now three o'clock in the morning. I'm about to get on this train here. Uh, and I'll be in Akutsk in about 30 hours. Spasiba. <laughs> okay. Join me in the next episode of Modern Grand Tour, where we'll be in the city of Akutsk and on the breathtaking Okon Island, and where we'll go back to basic living, climb some rocks, learn about shamanism, and of course, meet the locals. So until next time, Godspeed.